Hello, everyone, and welcome to the April 2023 Tarjan Center Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm Dr. Jas Rastabio, Director of Training for the Tarjan Center, and it's my pleasure to be here with you today. Um, before we get started, a few reminders. We do offer live Spanish interpretation, and our attendees can click on the Spanish interpretation button, which looks like a globe on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar, and select Spanish for interpretation. Please also enter your questions for our speaker into the Q&A function throughout the talk, and we'll facilitate discussion at the end of the presentation. After today's lecture, please be sure to complete our evaluation survey. We love to hear from our audience what topics you're interested in and how we can better serve the needs of the Tarjan community. The link to the evaluation survey will be sent in the chat today, as well as in a follow-up email uh, tomorrow. All right, and with that, I'll introduce our speaker, Dr. Megan Beardmore. Dr. Megan Beardmore is a licensed school psychologist with expertise in assessment and treatment of children and young adults with neurodevelopmental disorders and commonly co-occurring challenges such as emotion dysregulation. Originally from Iowa, she received her graduate training at the University of Arizona, where she practiced in schools and community mental health settings. During her pre-doctoral internship, she served as the evaluation coordinator at a K-8 school, a role that involves determining special education eligibility. Dr. Beardmore then received specialized postdoctoral training in the assessment and treatment of children with ASD at the HELP Group and UCLA. She later worked in a non-public school where she developed a social skills program and provided teacher training. Currently, Dr. Beardmore works at Spectrum Psych, splitting her time between conducting psychological evaluations and providing outpatient therapy. Her focus in assessment tends to target psychoeducational, social emotional, and autism specific referrals. In therapy, she draws upon a flexible, integrative blend of evidence based and holistic interventions. And with that, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Dr. Megan Beardmore. Thank you. Thank you for having me, everyone. I'll go ahead and share my screen. Okay. So thank you everyone for joining me today. This topic is near and dear to my heart and I am very grateful for the folks here joining me and for your eagerness to learn more about this topic. So let's briefly review the objectives, which are pretty straightforward. We are going to spend some time learning about autonomic dysfunction in autism, and then we will learn some practical strategies to better manage our emotions. And a quick note on terminology, I will be using identity first language because many individuals on the autism spectrum see autism as a part of their identity. However, I also recognize that some folks prefer person first language, but my intention is to be as inclusive and respectful of everyone as I can be, okay. So let's first start with what autonomic dysfunction is. So when I'm talking about autonomic dysfunction, I am referring to the nervous system, specifically this chunk, which is called the autonomic nervous system. And the autonomic nervous system regulates very important involuntary physiological processes like our heart rate, blood pressure, our breathing and digestion. And it's split into two more branches. We have the sympathetic branch, which is better known as our fight or flight system. And we also have the parasympathetic system, which is better known as our rest and digest processes. Okay, so I'll show this picture to get a sense of what this means, and I don't want to get too bogged down in anatomy here, but the important takeaway, let me make sure we can see the top, there we go, of the screen, let's see here, sorry about that, just want to make sure we get the whole picture, okay, so Yes, the sympathetic nervous system, which you see on the left-hand side, is going to get the body prepared to manage a threat, or it brings our focused attention to something. So it does this by doing a lot of different things. Uh, it increases our blood pressure. Uh, it tells our gastrointestinal system to stop what it's doing so it can devote more of its energy to managing the threat. 
And really what's happening here is that the sympathetic system is leading to a state of overall elevated activity and focused attention. So it tells every living tissue of our bodies to prepare, hence the name fight or flight, right? We're preparing to manage or deal with a stressor, okay? And then on the right-hand side, we have the parasympathetic nervous system, which is kind of the opposite side of the coin. It promotes our rest and digest processes, okay? So some examples of things that happen on this side are our blood pressure is lowering, our digestion can resume again, just to name a few examples. Okay, now I'd like everyone to really embody these two sides of the same coin with a little exercise. So I will first have everyone find your heartbeat or find your pulse. A couple different places we can do that. Is that your wrist for some folks? can try your neck area. And some people may even be able to just put their hand over their heart. So give everybody just a few seconds to find your pulse. And then holding on to your pulse or your heartbeat, I want you to notice what happens to the speed of your heart rate when you inhale and what happens to the speed of your heart rate when you exhale? So does your heart rate drop or lower when you breathe in? Or does your heart rate drop or lower when you breathe out? Okay. You can exaggerate this exercise by really taking a full breath in, pausing at the top, and slowly exhaling. So I'll stop talking for about a minute here. So everyone can do this. We're breathing in. And watch what happens when you breathe out. So if y'all want to entertain me, put in the chat what you noticed. So specifically what I'm looking for is what happened to your heart rate, what happened to the speed of your heart rate on your exhale. Did your heart rate speed up or slow down when you breathe out? What did you notice? Uh, it looks like the chat's disabled. Hang on, I think you're seeing the Q and A in the picture. We'll wait until we can get the the chat on. may not be able to get the chat on. We'll see. I'll give it just a few more seconds. In the meantime, everybody just keep enjoying your nice deep inhales and exhales. Okay. I'm going to take an answer I got from the Q&A. Um, let's see, because I don't want to explode the Q&A. Hopefully many of you noticed 
that our heart rate slows down on the exhale. And usually we need to do this exercise for at least a full minute or two. And really, if you did not get that sensation, really exaggerate that exhale or even slow, slow down at the bottom of that breath. Yay. I hope for some of you, you were able to really get that sensation. Apologies about the chat. Okay. All right. So if we know that our heart rate slows down with our out breath, this gives us a good idea of what happens with the autonomic nervous system. And our autonomic nervous system is like that picture you see is that it's that teeter totter or that seesaw. Okay. So our inhale is associated with our fight or flight system. So it's going up. And then our exhale is associated with the rest digest system. So an even breath should keep our teeter totter or our seesaw pretty balanced. And just another example to really drive this home is that I'm sure many of us are familiar when we are frustrated about something that we might just like a heavy sigh of relief, right? It's called that for a reason. So our bodies know that when we are experiencing tension in the body, that our exhale can be used to really boost that rest digest system and help us feel a little better. Okay. So now that we have at least an oversimplified understanding of the autonomic nervous system, let's take some time to discuss some of the sources that support the notion of autonomic dysfunction in autism. So autonomic dysfunction, meaning the teeter-totter is having a hard time staying balanced. Okay. So we can first take our attention to some of the literature or research base. And what I want to really convey here is that autonomic dysfunction or dysregulation can be measured in a lot of different ways. So I'll just be sharing some examples. So first, it's probably very well known to a lot of us here that gastrointestinal symptoms such as chronic constipation and diarrhea are reported more often in autistic individuals than non-autistic individuals. It is also probably pretty well known that sleep problems also burden this population. And something we may not realize is that our gut and sleep functions are associated with the autonomic nervous system. And, you know, we can't really say like, oh, there's autonomic dysfunction in this population because of gut problems and sleep problems. These are more of our loose type of associations, but still worth mentioning, I think. Um, there's also more robust measures as well. So there are some studies that have looked at pupil size changes in response to different stimuli or threats. And what we know about the dilation and constriction of our pupils is it's determined by a balance of inhibitory and excitatory activity. So it's, we're looking at that fight or flight, rest, digest balance. We also know that our pupil size changes are mediated or influenced by norepinephrine. And what we know about norepinephrine is that too much of it is going to promote anxiety, increase our heart rate and our blood pressure. So in multiple ways, pupil size can and has been shown to demonstrate ner uh, nervous system dysfunction in autistic individuals. There are also studies that use salivary indicators of cortisol and alpha amylase, which are used to measure stress. So in those studies, they're looking at factors involved in the sympathetic nervous system. Now, perhaps some of the most robust studies are using all sorts of cardiovascular measures. So things like resting cardiac vagal tone, our blood pressure, heart rate, heart rate variability, um, there is one study that suggested low baseline cardiac parasympathetic activity, so too little of the rest digest system, and also evidence of elevated sympathetic tone in individuals with autism. So you can kind of see that we're building an evidence base that suggests no matter kind of how we are measuring it, we're seeing that that teeter-totter is out of balance, and specifically that the sympathetic nervous system or our fight or flight is a little too high. And just to note that last icon on the image you see there is that we even have autonomic symptom surveys, which are really interesting ways of 
just self-report measures of how these symptoms are showing up in autistic individuals. Okay, so I could keep going and going. The literature is very exciting to me, but I will spare everyone more of the details so we can get into the meat of this talk. But just know that there's, you know, we can measure skin conductance and even joint hypermobility all to support the notion of autonomic dysfunction. Okay, so now I would like to share where I personally personally see the presentation of autonomic dysfunction, which is in the therapy room. And, you know, even during my training, I had a supervisor tell me at one point, when you're working with individuals on the spectrum, you're not just treating the core symptoms related to autism, like social skills, challenges, and flexibility. You are treating other things that go hand in hand. Okay. And the most common complaint I hear from both children and adults is about emotion regulation and feelings and managing our feelings works right along with autonomic dysfunction. And I'll explain a little bit more of that as we get into the presentation more, but basically it's harder to regulate our emotions when our nervous system is out of whack, right? Um, so how emotion dysregulation is manifesting most obviously can be through what I'm going to call tantrums, which is just big emotional reactions to things and having a hard time calming down, despite knowing what our triggers are, despite working with parents who have excellent behavior management skills, despite knowing all of our really good coping skills, okay? And tantrums and big meltdowns are very noticeable, but there's also emotion dysregulation that manifests through other less noticeable forms, which I refer to as internalizing symptoms like anxiety and depression, which are also quite prevalent. Just other ways that this nervous system dysfunction is showing up. Okay. And finally, it's worth touching on how autonomic dysfunction is understood and treated from a medication standpoint. So the mechanism of action of some of these medications like clonidine, propranolol, guanfacine have a direct impact on the autonomic nervous system by targeting certain receptors that decrease hyperarousal and reactivity to stress. So in other words, they're dampening that fight or flight system. And therefore, we shouldn't really be surprised that we see studies using these medications that have shown improvements in aggression, irritability, anxiety, sleep time, even task performance and working memory. And just to add some fuel to the fire, we are not just dealing with autonomic dysfunction, we are dealing with interoception challenges in neurodivergent populations. So interoception is the ability to sense the internal state of the body. And challenges with this can impact our awareness of when we know when we're hungry or thirsty, when to empty our bowels, our sensitivity to pain and temperature. And as it pertains to this talk, our emotions. And the word that we have for difficulty identifying and describing one's emotions is alexithymia, which is having a hard time knowing what you're feeling and connecting to that felt sense of the emotions in the body. And the flip side, emotions can also be felt very intensely, which can make it really hard to move on or to self-soothe because of that intensity. Okay. So by now, I hope we are gathering up quite a bit of support for why interventions that target the body are so necessary. And the theory that I'll be relying on when I recommend certain body-based interventions is known as polyvagal theory. So let's look at another complicated diagram, shall we? Okay, so polyvagal theory targets what we know about the vagus nerve or what's called the 10th cranial nerve. And it sits back right here. I suppose, I don't know if you can see me, but right back this part of the brain stem. And it makes up a ma the main part of the parasympathetic nervous system. And what we can see without even needing to really read the text on this image is that 
the vagus nerve has a vast influence on the functions of our visceral organs and bodily processes, including our emotion regulation, our immune response, in addition to everything else I've already mentioned, like digestion and heart rate. Okay, you know, it's no big deal, right? This is just a nerve that is casually in charge of all these big vital functions. All right. So the vagus nerve is also the longest nerve in our bodies, and it is responsible for the bi-directional flow of information between the brain and the body, or what some might call the gut-brain connection. And something quickly here that I didn't mention about the studies demonstrating autonomic dysfunction and autism also refer to their findings as having weak vagal tone, okay, which basically means that the vagus nerve is not working to the best of its ability. So why I'm really showing this complicated diagram is really so you know that the interventions I will be suggesting are those that directly impact the vagus nerve. Okay. Now that bi-directional flow of information is pretty important. And the ratio of information that gets sent, there's a very specific ratio. So there's 20% of the fibers of the vagus nerve that are called efferent, meaning signals that run from the brain to the body. Okay. And then we have the remaining 80% of the vagal fibers being afferent or body to brain that channels a flow of bottom up information. Okay. So in other words, 80% of the information that we are getting to our brains is initiated from the body. Okay. So I'm sure I confused a lot of people with including bottoms up in the title of my presentation, but the whole point and very exciting news is that when we are dealing with emotion regulation, we can directly rewire and soothe the arousal system by using body-based interventions. Very exciting, right? Okay. But first, let's have a moment of respect for our top-down approaches. Okay. So these approaches all involve recognizing the meaning you've created around things. So some examples we have, you know, when our thoughts or our meaning, ma meaning making isn't making sense for us, or if it's not serving us, we have things like cognitive distortion. So we can catastrophize or have really rigid thinking about certain things. It also includes our other self-limiting beliefs. But the premise with these interventions is that if we can challenge our belief patterns, that means you can change your behaviors which is really awesome, right? So some examples that use top-down approaches, of course, we have cognitive behavioral therapy. We have DBT, really most talk-based therapies, okay? And I also want to use this opportunity to share a disclaimer that I come from a background in training that is heavily influenced by behaviorism and CBT. There is so much research that supports those types of interventions. And really what I want to focus on though, is that when we over rely on these methods, we face some important limitations. So for one abstraction or thinking about our thinking is hard. Okay. Especially for kids on the spectrum and processing language can be really challenging too, especially for individuals with intellectual delays. Then we have our second big pitfall is that when we are dysregulated, the part of our brains that helps us think logically essentially turns off. Okay. So in our world, a lot of us clinicians are using a visual. So if you can see me, um, you really, if our hand is our brain, the thumb is our emotion brain, our limbic system. And our fingers are our logical brain. So the brain that helps us make good decisions and can rationalize and do all of the higher order types of thinking. Okay. When we are dysregulated or having a hard time emotionally, that part of our brain turns off. Okay. So we say our lid comes off. 
it's going to be really hard to use our coping skills if our lid is off, right? So when we are, are learning about our thoughts and managing our thoughts, it can be very, very helpful, but it's not enough. Once we have a good understanding of our thoughts, we still have to manage the felt experiences of our emotions. And I'll use a very personal example. So if I am nervous about giving this presentation, which I am, I might have all sorts of thoughts about how it's going to be terrible and how I'm going to sweat through my clothes and all of the things. I can work with those thoughts. I can say, you know, it's going to go great. I'm probably going to stumble, but people will love it and this, that, and the other. But problem is I'm still sweating a lot and my gut still feels really upset. My mouth feels a little dry. My jaw is tightening. I have to be able to deal with my body in order to regulate. Okay. So we made it to our bottom up approaches. Thank you everyone for bearing with me. I just wanted to make sure we all felt very convinced that body-based interventions are so important. And bottom-up approaches are those that directly access that, that limbic system or the emotional brain. And we have some examples being yoga, polyvagal theory, somatic experiencing, EMDR, drama therapy, all of these are really using the goal of having the individual be in their bodies and being able to self-soothe through that discomfort, being able to contact our inner safety net or our life raft with some sense of orientation to the present moment. Okay. And I don't have the time to keep blabbing, but just know that so much good can happen when we are connected with our bodies. Now, it's also worth mentioning that for thousands of years, cultures all over the world have used movement for connecting with and healing the body. And just some examples worth mentioning are yoga originating in India. We have Tai Chi and Qigong in China. We have rhythmical drumming originating all throughout Africa, capoeira in Brazil, and we have Japan and the Korean Peninsula spawning martial arts, which are really just allowing that, that being in our bodies, using purposeful movement and being connected to the present moment. Okay. All right. So in the therapeutic context, I begin by teaching both children and adults about our three autonomic states. And we will all practice this together, ideally. So as I describe the feelings and experiences associated with each of these three states, I want you to pay attention to what resonates within you and what that experience feels like in your body. Okay. So our first state is our safety state. Our ventral vagal system is active. And when we are in this place, our breath feels smooth. We feel very much in the present moment. We are connected to people, our own bodies. Um, feelings that go in this state are being happy or curious. Uh, the common feeling for me is like, I feel like I have a grip on things, like everything is okay. Uh, our perception of the world might feel safe and fun and peaceful. Okay. So that's our safety system. And our fight or flight, which we already know about, is overactive when we are in the fight or flight state. So that sympathetic nervous system is really jacked up. Okay. Our nervous systems have sensed a threat and feelings that commonly happen when we are in fight or flight can range from anxiety all the way on the other end of the spectrum being panic. We can feel irritable and then all the way to rageful. So those feelings live here and the perception of our world can be one that, you know, we feel like the world is dangerous or not trustworthy. It's chaotic. That's just kind of a, our sense of things, right? And in the freeze state, this happens when we feel trapped. Okay. So 
what happens here is our fight or flight system, that sympathetic nervous system is saying, don't even bother. If we turn on, it's futile. It's just, don't even worry about it. Like give up, why bother? So we are trapped. We are in a place where we are shut down. We can feel dissociated, uh, disconnected from ourselves and from other people. Uh, it's a place of not feeling like numbness. Even we can feel foggy or hopeless, depressed, but that's just the sense of like, I'm on my own and no one's going to find me while I'm here. So each of these three states, as you were listening to those descriptions should be somewhat familiar to you, right? We have all been in each of these states. And for many of us, we fluctuate between the three many times throughout the day. All right. And it's also worth mentioning that for many of us, we gravitate to one primary state. And again, for me, I have no problem admitting that my body really likes hanging out in fight or flight. And the, the image I use for this is sort of when you see rain falling on a window that there's a, a track for most of the rain that it's falling into, right? Our nervous systems work the same way. We are going to gravitate to one particular state. Even, even though I know fight or flight is not the state I want to be in, I like safety. Safety feels good, but because it's familiar, my body is going to gravitate towards that state. Okay. So again, in this therapeutic work, we want to first increase our awareness to the physiological cues we get from the body. So we know that the autonomic nervous system is always scanning our environment for cues of safety or danger before our thinking brain, right? Before that forebrain even knows. Um, I'll give you an example of you know, I see something out of the corner of my eye that looks like a snake. I might gasp and I realize it's just a belt that I haven't picked up off my floor for days. Okay. So you can tell that even, even then I know what it was, but my body was already getting ready to prepare to manage that threat. All right. So that is why we want to first get in tune with what we notice is happening in our body, notice the sensations, and then we can put names to those sensations or label the feeling. Okay. All right. So one way that we can get in touch with our sensations is through body mapping. And this worksheet is just an example, but we really want to look for a cluster of bodily signals that tell us what state we're in. So again, going back to my anxiety example, um, a cluster of symptoms that I know tells me that I am in the fight or flight system is when I am sweating. I, my mouth is dry. My jaw is clenching. So that kind of cluster tells me, okay, my sympathetic nervous system, my fight or flight system is really overactive right now, but everybody is a little different. Okay. So the point is you have to feel, you have to get a sense of what is happening in your own body that tells us what state we are in. Okay. Now for the listeners here who are practitioners or clinicians, this is a slide for you specifically, our job is also to watch and help our patients learn about their autonomic systems. And especially in a person to person or face to face interaction, we can really get a lot of information. So again, I realize that this is an overcomplicated photo and I don't want you to get bogged down in too many of the details, but well, and, and it's also breaking down more than just our three core states. So it's showing some more subtleties, but just to review and look at some of these basics here. So something that I look for in a therapeutic context is I'm, I'm noticing slight shifts in body position and posture. So perhaps someone comes in and we are, you know, they feel like pretty relaxed for flowing. And then we start talking about something that's really painful or difficult. I might notice that the chest starts to collapse. Um, if it's something that is really irritating to them, I might notice changes in the breath. I might notice even changes in the eyes. Okay. So forgive me. I, I don't know if you can see some of these things here, but there's all sorts of things we can look for. I don't know how obvious certain things are like skin tone and 
heart rate. But the idea is that when we notice the shift as the clinician, those are our cues that tell us where to take the work. So if I sent somebody into really an agitated state, I want to dial it down. So you can see in the bottom of this image, put on the brakes, let's back off this. If someone is coming in feeling very down or that their freeze system is on, I am going to want to increase energy. And I'll give some examples of how we can do that right now. Okay, so interventions to move us out of freeze. First, remember that in freeze, our nervous system is basically telling our fight or flight system, why bother? It's, you're not going to make it. Okay. Um, I, I really like using animal <laughs> analogies, but if you imagine, I, I also don't really know how food chains work, but I'm imagining a rabbit and maybe, I don't know, do deer eat rabbit? Okay. Um, <laughs> so maybe a rabbit sees a predator coming and it knows that it's about to be eaten. It's going to go into a freeze, right? That fight or flight is not going to be worth it to turn on. Okay. So the goal here when we're in a freeze state is that we want to increase cycles of sympathetic arousal or charge, and then we'll learn how to discharge it once we're in the sympathetic state. Okay. So let's start with touch. Touch is wonderful. We can use touch with others. So having a hug from a safe person feels really nice. Um, touch with an animal is really great for returning to that safety system. Um, yeah, what we know about touch is that touch with others, even touching ourselves, right? When we are really activated like or shut down, I might just have somebody press their hands together or just feel their arms, going down each arm really gently, but touch helps us feel connected. It also brings us back to our own bodies. Okay. Now movement. So any kind of movement, you can dance, shake, play, literally anything. All right. And you know, this far into the presentation, I would imagine that how most of you have stayed paying attention is by moving a little bit, right? You can't sit still the whole time. Uh, I'm in my swivel chair. I'm kind of swaying. So everyone is off camera. I also can't hear you. So take this opportunity. If you haven't already, maybe you want to move standing up. And yes, I will have us do most of these interventions. So you feel free to stand up, maybe sway from side to side, get some of the wiggles out. Okay. Two important things about movement while you're doing your movement, I hope, is that movement is often talked about to help kids focus, right? We have our fidget spinners and all sorts of things, but it's really to help us regulate. Movement helps us regulate. If we are regulated, then we can focus. But a fidget spinner is not the thing that makes us focus. It is, it is our movement. Um, I'm sure that could be argued. <laughs> but anyway... So the other thing I want to mention about movement is that autistic individuals often shake, bounce, flap, or engage in other self-stimming behaviors. And most of us, all of us probably know by now, but this is just another reminder that we don't want to eliminate stimming. It's actually very important for regulation. Okay. So five, four, three, two, one. Some of you might be familiar with this one. So let's do this as I kind of talk about it. So wherever you are, I want you to look for five different things you can see. And I know my chat is off. That's okay. But I'll trust that everyone can maybe be labeling five things you see, whatever you're looking at. I'll share. I'm looking at a globe light. I can look at all sorts of things outside, but that might be distracting. I can look at my water, I can look at my backpack. Okay. Four things you can feel. Okay. So I feel my body in this chair. I feel my hair resting against my body. I feel my hands, hand over hand. I feel I have a shawl that's resting on my lap. Those types of things. Okay. Three things you can hear. That might be challenging. 
if you're lucky enough to be in a place where there's not much to hear. Hopefully you hear the sound of my voice. That's a start. Okay. I hear we have a noise machine in the hallway. It's kind of tough, All right? Three things you can try to hear. Two things you can smell. So we're getting down to the senses, but there's probably not going to be a lot for us, but two things you can smell. Right. And then one thing you can taste. All right. So if you did that exercise with me, you can see that it helps us get really into the present moment, right? So that's again, what we want to do when we're getting out of freeze, we want to come back to the present moment. All right. And then the last one I'll mention is that heat exposure is really nice um, when we are in freeze. Okay. So heat increases our heart rate and it reduces muscle tension. So a little two for deal with heat. Okay. Now let's talk about ways to get out of fight or flight. So the premise here is that there is too much arousal in our bodies and we need to discharge it. So thereby deepening that relaxation and regulation that we want. So exhales, okay? We didn't, we did the exercise in the beginning. Exhales are the moneymaker. They're my favorite, okay? So we understand that like physiological sigh, it's the reason why I like it is because it's, it's always accessible to us. We can always make our exhales longer than our inhale. Um, we had different ways to kind of go about this for kids. You can blow bubbles really slowly, right? Can't make good bubbles unless you're having a long, slow exhale. You can breathe with a pinwheel, watch it spin. Um, one of our occupational therapists actually shared with me that you can use a straw and blow a cotton ball across the ground. And you can even in, just visualize that, right? You don't need all the supplies, but lots of different ways that we can use long, slow exhales. And something I want to mention about any of these exercises, but particularly the exhale is that I am looking for a practice of three minutes as my minimum. That's my gold zone right? So if you do inhale for two and exhale for four, for three minutes, you can get the nervous system regulated. So that that's why I'm recommending three is that we need long enough for that teeter totter to go. Okay. All right. So the second one here is a fun one is bitter and sour taste. So there was the picture early on. And I also mentioned for my anxiety that I feel very like my mouth gets really dry so we want to produce saliva. Um, I don't know if anyone wants to have a snack, but you can even think of, if you close your eyes and imagine yourself biting into a lemon, right? And you should get that kind of sensation that one that makes you want to swallow. Okay. So we want just by increasing saliva production, we are telling our parasympathetic nervous system, like we can, we can come back online now. All right. Um, and for me, I really like the bitter and sour taste because, you know, I always need a reason to go buy and eat an entire bag of salt and vinegar chips. Yes. Okay. <laughs> so cold exposure is another really good example. So of course, contrary to heat, like we just saw in getting out of freeze, cold exposure is great. So you can do this in a number of ways. Uh, if you are really daring and bold or really dysregulated, take a cold shower for as cold as you can take it for as long as you can take it. Um, someone like me, I have a really hard time doing that. It just feels a little too much. So uh, something that I have done is just running cold water under my wrists. Uh, if my water bottle was cold, I could be using it to just place my wrists or my neck to cool down, right? Lots of different ways we can use cold exposure. It's just really your comfort and what you can handle, but lean, lean into the discomfort a little bit. Cause if we really want to get back into regulation, we're going to need to it to be kind of drastic. Okay. Um, bilateral stimulation is an, a fancy way of talking about activating both hemispheres of the brain. So some of us know that in eye movement, des desensitation, desensitation and reprocessing, EMDR, 
what we know is that we are using bilateral stimulation in that processing work. So the premise here is that when we are using both hemispheres of the brain, that we are chilling out the part of our brain known as the amygdala that gets us all worked up, okay? And I would like everyone here to practice bilateral stimulation by crossing your arms over your chest and just tap back and forth. Can do this while you're listening. Right. And you can see it doesn't have to be butterfly over the chest. You can do it on your legs. Um, the cool thing is that most exercise, almost all exercise, is bilateral stimulation, right? If we're walking, we're using both hemispheres of the brain. So that one, lots of things we can do with. Okay. Uh, one of my favorites is very, very old, thousands of years old, Jin Shin Jitsu pose. So I would like everyone to take their right hand and yes, the right and left is important for this. So take your right hand and place it under your left armpit or even like just hugging kind of your, rib, your ribs. The side here doesn't have to be all the way up into your armpit. And then place your left hand over your right bicep. And almost immediately, I just... Mm, feels so yummy. So this pose is really, really good for a lot of reasons. One, it reminds us of our container, right? If I'm having a really difficult emotional experience, it, it kind of feels like I'm taking a flat iron to my emotions or I'm softening the raw edges when I'm in this pose. So I'm coming back into regulation. I am witnessing all of the happenings in my body that are right here. And I'm right here. Okay. It's just a really lovely one that I like. All right. So we learned some practical strategies to return our nervous systems back to safety when we are either in freeze or fight or flight. And now I would like to just offer some bonus exercises that serve the broader focus of increasing our vagal tone. So remembering that picture, um, we want to sort of boost it up with these exercises. Okay. So, and again, going back to that picture, one more referencing of it is that you saw how the vagus nerve runs down the body. So the first couple of examples that I'll use here are those that directly stimulate the vagus nerve. Okay. So let's start with an ear massage. All right. So this is going to be a little bit tricky, but I'm going to try to show you my ear. Hope it looks okay. Um, if you take a finger and you go into the first fold, then I want you to drop into the second fold. So it is, some people have more than two or three folds. So I just don't want you in this bottom one, like your ear hole. Okay. I want you in the middle. You can do this with both hands, but just very gently. And I, I please don't push on it because that's not going to feel good. But I want you to just take small circles. Okay. You can hang out here as long as you like. Um, I know the chat is closed, but if somebody wants to share any interesting things they might find in their ears, that might be entertaining for us. The idea is if we sit here long enough, you can even reverse the direction. Hopefully you start feeling a little relaxed. Some people don't like that sensation. That's fine. Take it or leave it, right? But we are directly accessing that vagus nerve and just soothing it or stimulating it, okay? Gargling, humming, and singing are lovely for lots of different reasons, even laughing, which is something I didn't put on this slide. Um, that is directly also working with the vagus nerve, right? So again, I can't see you. I can't hear you. If you are able to, I would like everyone to hum a tune very loudly in their mouths for like 20 seconds. Okay. So please start if you haven't. Um, for me, I will recommend a different way to go about this. If you don't want to hum a certain song or if you don't like singing, um, you can use the voo sound. So 
I will do that. And I am doing it loud enough that I can feel it. I can feel it in my jaw. I can feel it in my throat. Okay. So it's probably going to sound a little annoying, but this is what it sounds like. Okay. Doesn't matter what tone you can be totally right. Like this is not music class. This is just to get some stimulation to that vagus nerve. Okay. We can also increase our vagal tone in less direct ways too. So going outside is really great. Um, for those of us in the Northern hemisphere, hopefully everybody can venture outside more. Uh, being outside is wonderful for lots of different reasons, but I bet you didn't know that it increases your vagal tone. So that's just another good reason to be outside. Um, exercise, I already mentioned with bilateral stimulation, exercise is really great for the fight or flight response. And it also increases vagal tone. Um, something for those of you who are like real big exercisers may know that your heart rate variability um, improves when you exercise. Okay. So lots of different reasons why exercising is great. And then something I just learned recently is that probiotics can also increase vagal tone. And that makes sense knowing that our vagus nerve, if you saw that picture, right, it's all up in our guts. All right. So happy gut, happy vagus nerve. Okay. All right. Let's see here. I know I'm short on time. Um, I want to talk about sideways approaches really quickly. So sideways, meaning it's a more passive stance to regulate the nervous system. Okay. And a practice that refers to this is mindfulness, which what we're doing here is that we're bringing attention to what is happening in our body in a non-judgmental way. And the goal is to get in tune with the body, to be able to trust our sensations without being overwhelmed by them. Okay. So there's a lot of power and resilience that comes with the knowledge that we can deal with the worst of our emotional storms if we recognize they aren't here to stay, right? So a couple of different examples that we don't have time to go into. I am a big fan of Dr. Dan Siegel's work and his wheel of awareness. So you can look into that if that's something you're interested in. Um, but he's just talking about how, what, how we can change our focus and what we're focusing on kind of botched that, but you can look into it more. Acceptance and commitment therapy also uses mindfulness approaches. So we can watch our sort of imagine like watching our thoughts pass, like they're clouds in the sky. So when we know when we're watching clouds in the sky, they change, right? They move and they might feel like they're hanging out for a long time, but it's impermeable, right? That's the whole idea. So mindfulness or sideways approaches are really great for a couple of different reasons, but one, because it probably is unsurprising at this point, it increases our vagal tone. Yay. All right. We should all be doing more mindfulness. Um, and it is also a bridge to CBT. That's how I think about it. So if we use mindfulness with our thoughts, for example, we can just sense how thoughts register in the body. And again, that impermeability of our thoughts gives us a lot to work with. Okay. Closing thoughts. Of course, I had to include a Rumi quote. We love a Rumi quote. There is a voice that doesn't use words. Listen. Okay. So none of us can overcorrect for how our nervous system responds to things. Our nervous system is a remarkable, adaptive, incredible system, but we can't outsmart it. All right. So if anything, the takeaway from today's presentation should be very straightforward, which is do not miss out on the gold mine that our bodies yield. It has such important information for us. And once we are equipped with that information, it is a portal to regulation right? Feeling our feelings without being overwhelmed by them. Okay. And then the last slide here is my references. So I will go ahead and stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Dr. Beardmore, for such a wonderful and informative presentation. Um, I really loved how you 
included the theory behind a lot of these somatic interventions and truly really walked us through so many exercises. I think this is probably one of the most calm presentations that we've had. Um, and there's a lot of feedback in the chat, as well as just really expressing amazing gratitude for your presentation today. So thank you so much for um, being here. Um, I'll start us off um, in terms of Q&A uh, for our attendees. Please feel free to continue to enter your questions for Dr. Beardmore into the chat. Um, I'll try to condense everything into some of our top questions. Um, but I'm wondering, Dr. Beardmore, um, just to start us off here um, with um, what you, how you came to become interested in this line of work um, and in utilizing these interventions with um, the clients that you work with. That is a wonderful question. So for me, I, I think I had mentioned that my training is very CBT heavy. And it sort of, you know, I'm still a pretty new practitioner myself. So I, I was getting the sense of like, I'm getting so many complaints about emotion regulation and I can give people all of the tools and I'm just hitting barrier after barrier. So it felt like something is missing because the amount of what's happening in the body is just, it's too much to just go about it from, you know, thinking about our our thoughts and our behavior. So it was really kind of my own sort of self-study and then found some colleagues and got some training and here I am. Wonderful. I mean, I think a lot of us here can uh, sympathize with that experience of, you know, just wanting some way to work through the fog or clear the fog with a lot of our clients. So that way you can do the work in thinking about thinking and, you know, work on that CBT triangle. Um, you know, I think that some similar um, curriculum that some of us might be familiar with uh, might be like super flex with glass man and just having those strong emotions where you're wanting to work through it. Um, but I love the thought of integrating some of these short exercises, um, especially with your recommendation of just devoting maybe like three minutes at the beginning of session to just, you know, get into a regulated state. Um, so that way our clients can, can work through these things. Um, one question that we have in the Q&A is, um, what if that individual you're working with um, just doesn't want to do these soothing options? Um, any yeah. recommendations on getting through that or, you know, kind of just getting over the hump of um, that refusal or resistance? Yeah, I, I think we need the entire, I think everybody here needs to help me brainstorm that really good question. Mm -hmm. um, I run into that all the time. I think something I try to do is I'm, I'm really trying to partner with the child or the adult and get them to see that whatever they're doing is not working essentially. So I'm not saying you have to sit down and we're going to do breath work. Um, I'll say, I'll try to guide them to whatever practices or, you know, you just broke your phone last week. We can't, can't have that, you know, so we have to use some other options. Um, I think rewards are really great. So if we can incentivize using these coping skills, that makes things a lot easier. Um, and I also tell everybody that I have dozens and dozens and dozens of options. I, I get a lot of eye rolls about breath work and that's fine just because it's my favorite doesn't have to be everybody's favorite. So um, I like to say this is trial and error. Let's just give it a try. See how it goes. But yeah. A tough Even one. Other methods like pulling an exercise out of the hat and, you know, it's up to chance. Like we'll do it together um, rather than making the other, the individual feel like this is imposed on them what they have to do. Yeah, totally. Um, another question in the Q and A is um, any recommendations on uh, a technique that can be used maybe in a group setting or like a classroom um, without, you know, drawing, you know, so, without um, drawing attention to a person. Oh, yes. That's a really good one. Um, something I didn't mention that even I do, like when I was in the presentation, right? I'm not going like this the whole time. It's a little too obvious, but I am feeling my feet on the ground. Um, sometimes when we focus our attention on the breath, that can be a little bit activating, right? If our breath's kind of shallow, it's like, oh gosh, I don't want to think about it. I'm going to come to a neutral part of my body and really just try to stay there. So I'm feeling my feet on the ground. I'm feeling the pressure of my shoes around my feet. It is neutral. Um, that's one thing I'll do. And then can I plug breath work one more time? 
I think breath work is really great for a classroom setting or a group setting because it shouldn't be super noticeable, right? I can be doing two, four breathing or focusing on breath coming from the, the lower abdomen. So even if I'm not changing the in-breath versus out-breath, I am trying to breathe from my belly. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot more I'm happy to share, but to start great suggestions to start um, and maybe also having um, like a signal for that student to remind them like yeah. maybe now you should do um, like some yeah. having like a, a card on the table other kinds of behavioral um, and behavior managed strategy strategies that we utilize in the classroom I think that would be a really nice marriage <laughs> yes <laughs> thanks for mentioning that yes Bye. Um, let's see here. I mean, I know that there are so many questions. Um, and so um, let's see here. I think just um, maybe the last question that we'll have before we wrap up and then everyone can, of course, include follow-up questions or requests for resources in the evaluation survey. Um, any kind of other takeaways or suggestions for families who might be in the audience on how to integrate these interventions into daily routines um, or, you know, in, in the moment when we're feeling like a, a tantrum or a behavioral outburst is, is on the horizon? Mm -hmm. That's a really wonderful question to end on. Um, I will say above and like above anything, I want parents to model regulation themselves. So we know that our children are looking for our reactions to things all the time, right? There is something that we call co-regulation that is very, very important and doesn't go away no, no matter how old your, your kid is. Okay, so if you can model taking a deep breath, if you can model, you know, I need to, I need to use one of my containment poses. I need to take a break. I need to breathe. If you can do that, modeling, modeling is everything. I think for a lot of parents, it's something you're not like, that is not going to end well is saying like, it's time to use your coping skills, right? It's usually not going to end well, but if, if the parent can model that, that is going to help the child. I think we all have experiences where, you know, you've walked into a room and you can just tell something's off by someone's energy. It's very real, right? If I am modeling regulation, the idea is that hopefully that there's going to be kind of a domino effect. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I think um, a lot of people appreciate that, um, that reminder that we can model these skills too. Um, mm -hmm. And they help us too, right? When we're able to regulate, then we can co-regulate with those we work with and with our loved ones. Um, so I love that suggestion. Um, so I know that there's lots of questions into the chat. Um, for our attendees, the uh, evaluation survey will be sent out via email tomorrow. So please send your questions and I can forward them to Dr. Beardmore. Um, but in the meantime, Dr. Beardmore, is there any um, way that our attendees, if they have questions or would like some follow-up that they can contact you? Yes. Should we put my email in the chat? Sure. Can mm -hmm. you do that? Yes. Okay. So yeah. webinar chat, I just have to, will you just tell me if everybody can see it? Mm -hmm. Yes, but to everyone else, while Dr. Beardmore is typing her contact information to the chat, the uh, recording, both in English and Spanish, will be available on our website in about a week, um, as well as the slides. And maybe Dr. Beardmore can include a couple additional resources like the handouts and those beautiful visuals that I know um, so many clinicians are <laughs> wanting to get their hands on. Uh, so we'll also have that posted on the website. All right. Well, thank you everyone for being here for our April 2023 Distinguished Lecture Series. Thank you so much, Dr. Beardmore, for um, such an informative presentation. I know so many of us are just, you know, taking lots of notes and can't wait to apply this to our clients and loved ones. Um, but thank you everyone for being here and we'll see you next month for the May um, Tarjan Lecture Series. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, everyone.